Hello, I'm Cyril Vanier. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, one of China's biggest shadow banks is in trouble. So what are those financial firms and what risks do they pose to the Chinese economy? Also this week, the Syrian president wants to end his nation's isolation, as many blame him for the free-falling economy. Plus, it's called yellow cake. As demand for uranium continues to increase, the price of this commodity used in nuclear power is soaring. It includes gigantic financial institutions. China's secretive shadow banking industry is worth more than $3 trillion. For perspective, that is roughly the size of Britain's economy. But after years of exponential growth, several firms have defaulted on billions of dollars of payments to investors. In recent years, the Chinese government has clamped down on risky lending to limit the risk of contagion to the wider economy. And now concern is growing again about the financial stability of shadow lenders. The Chongyang, one of the country's largest trusts, missed payments to clients in August. A pretty big warning sign. And the company then signed an agreement with two state-owned firms to help solve its problems. That was two weeks ago. Chongyang managed more than $87 billion worth of funds for corporate clients and wealthy individuals as of the end of 2022. It says at least 11% of its assets are invested in the property sector. So just before we go to our guests and try and figure all this out, let me brief you on what are shadow banks exactly. The term was coined in the U.S. a little more than 15 years ago. It refers to financial services that are offered outside the formal banking system. Unlike traditional banks, shadow lenders, including trusts like Chongyong, well, they're loosely regulated, and that means that they can lend more easily to more people. But their loans aren't guaranteed, as we're finding out. And there's less transparency, so it's also hard to know how much debt there actually is. Now, for decades, the Chinese government has bailed out many shadow firms when they've been in trouble. And they were seen as a safe place for wealthy Chinese to park their money. You see, trusts lure investors by offering significantly higher returns on their savings than banks do. That brings in a lot of cash. Shadow banks then lend that cash to companies across various sectors of the Chinese economy, including the property sector. That includes real estate developers. But China's real estate market is now in crisis. So the borrowers are struggling to repay the money that they borrowed. All right, Redmond Wong joins me from Hong Kong. Uh, sir, you're the Greater China Market Strategist at Saxo. We have now reached the point where some shadow banks have not been able to pay their customers because they themselves are not being repaid by the people they lent money to. How concerned are you by all of this? Uh, yes, yeah, it's a concern. And but I think the problem at the moment is, to a certain extent, is still contained. That one of the reasons is that is, uh, um, I mean, since early 2017, uh, China has launched a campaign to deleverage the economy. First, it's on the shadow banking sector, and then the property sector, and then the local government uh, debt. Pause, I mean, pause the for Chinese a second. Government has when not... you say deleverage the economy, educate us. What is that? Uh, basically, it's one to limit the, the, the financing and uh, you know, so it's not let them grow so much and um, is to reduce the financing through those channels. And um, I mean, they have not been very successful to limit the financing for the property sector and also the local government, those have still been growing, but they have been uh, made some success actually in uh, uh, reducing the size of the shadow banking sector. So that's number one. Number two, and there's a quite a big difference between uh, the U.S. shadow banking system and the China one. The China one actually most of the, is initially is that those money coming from the formal banking sector. It's the banking sector, the commercial bank, they want to do regulatory arbitrage, basically try to make use of some of the loophole so that they can lend at higher interest rates. They can also make some money by charging fees or those uh, management wealth management product to help the to, to keep the deposits and leave the money at the bank but not directly in the deposit which pay very low interest rate but is invested in those of uh, wealth management pro management product and the bank can still make some money 
And so they are actually uh, at the back of most of them. So uh, now I think they are, uh, the Chinese government tried to on the process to move um, a, a quite a bit of this is uh, uh, lending in the shadow banking system back to the formal banking system. So uh, yes, it's a, it's a problematic, but it's still uh, it's not out of control yet. Okay, and that goes back to what you're saying at the beginning that right now the risk is contained again. And I'm kind of asking you the mm. same question here: is how much risk is mm. there? systemic risk to the entire Chinese economy. I ask this because obviously the, the ghost of the 2008 financial crisis is still with us. And we all remember that if one bank mm. fails, yeah. if it's a big enough bank, then there's going to be a domino effect and so many other financial institutions are going to fail and it's going to put many ordinary people in trouble. What's the risk of that here? Uh, I think the, one of the relative size of the shadow banking systems, I mean, now 25 trillion, you are talking about uh, the total amount of uh, the debt to the non-financial sector in China is about 370 trillion. So there is only the shadow banking sector only now account for about seven seven percent of it. The commercial bank themselves account for 65 percent. So the commercial bank themselves is as, as uh, is really the backbone of the Chinese financial system. So. Um, some of those risks and some of the losses later are eventually falling back to the to the commercial bank system because they are actually either their customer or themselves are the lender to those uh, shadow bank and through those shadow bank to the to the developer uh, property developer and to the local government uh, financing a vehicle and also to some of those private enterprises with uh, lesser credit. So so um so uh, uh, from that sense, the very purport uh, 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 size of the shadow banking system to the formal banking system. So um, that is a risk that they probably can absorb. And uh, and the Chinese government is unlikely to pay them out, but they probably ah. will uh, block those SSLs and so on, the restructuring so on down the road. Well, so about that, I want to ask you, because you said the word mm -hmm. bailout. Um, Chong Yong, the trust that we're talking about uh, recently, about two weeks ago, signed an agreement uh, with two financial firms that are linked to state-owned uh, companies. Is that a government bailout, mm. a hidden government bailout, a partial government bailout? What is it? Uh, we don't know yet, but at the moment, both um, both the CITIC Trust and also CCB Trust, CCB Trust is related to the China Construction Bank, both are also trust companies. They are part of the shadow banking system and created by the, by the formal bank, formal banking sector. And um, so they, they, according to the agreement, they will go into uh, Zhongrong and then he said, you know, take over the operation, look at the books, and uh, so take control, And but they are not take, uh, uh, taking over the assets. I think they are maybe acting on behalf of the government and the regulators, that's pretty much for sure. But it's not a bailout yet because I think they are now still investigating. Redmond, stay with me because I want to run our viewers through a brief statement by Chong Yong earlier this month. Uh, it said that some investment products were unable to be paid on schedule. Direct quote there, unable to be paid on schedule because of multiple internal and external factors. It did not mention whether investors would be getting their money back. Dozens of angry clients held rare protests outside the company's offices in Beijing in August. Redmond, just as a reminder, we're talking about people, you know, who bought some financial products mm. expecting a financial return. And last month, in August, uh, they did not get their return. So they're justifiably pretty angry. How do you read that statement, internal, external factors? Uh, I mean, it's, I mean, internal external factor basically is, is includes everything. So I think it's not they are not really disclosing much uh, useful information. That's what I think now CITIC and CCB Trust uh, going into the company to take a look at the book and they have to go through the assets. But I think CITIC Trust and CCB Trust is going to uh, uh, to talk, take a look at the book and then work with the regulator to come up with some kind of restructuring plan. Uh, for uh, Zhong Yong. So it still remains to be seen, but, uh, but I credit that we, take some, we have to take some loss, I think. How much of this is tied to the property sector? I ask you this because I think even casual observers mm -hmm. of the Chinese economy, and I am among them, mm -hmm. will understand that the property sector drives so much of the economy. Over the last two decades, people have been investing, real estate developers and you know, private individuals have been investing in property because prices mm -hmm. kept going up. But now 
prices are falling. The risky part is really the quantity trading and women be um, uh, in uh, those are long uh, to the uh, developers. And among those, I think it's about, I mean, it's only estimate, it's not a very, I mean, uh, official or very accurate number, but it's about 18% of them are probably is uh, among the 20, uh, 20 trillion. So it's uh, about 3.5, 3.6 trillion from the shadow banking system, the trust company and so on, for different products and so on. So um, yes, I mean, it's, uh, if a property developer and they are in now in this financial distress that will affect uh, as a payment, uh, repayment to those uh, uh, investment product, and that will affect the shadow banking system. Redmond Wong, thank you so much for joining us on the program today. You are the Greater China Market Strategist at Saxo. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wong. Syrian President Bashar al-Assad has regained control of the majority of his nation's territory, but. After more than 12 years of civil war and Western sanctions, Syria is now in a deep economic crisis. The majority of Syrians live in poverty. More than 70% of the population needs humanitarian aid. As the cost of living rises, vulnerable households say that they have had enough. Hundreds of people have protested, mainly in the southern city of Sueda, demanding President Bashar al-Assad step down. Now, this province is the heartland of Syria's Druze community, a religious minority which had largely refused to align itself with either side during the nation's civil war. The protests have now entered their second month, echoing the 2011 uprising against Assad's rule. The Syrian government blames its economic trouble on Western sanctions, but many protesters in Sueda blame the government. <laughs> For 12 years, we endured a difficult and disgraceful life. The state has been robbed. I ask you, Bashar al-Assad, when will the people of Syria be able to live in dignity? Those living in coastal cities, I tell you, don't fear. Speak in loud voices, and if you can't because of Bashar's thugs, come to Swaida, where you can speak freely. The protests were sparked by government measures aimed at boosting the economy. They include slashing fuel subsidies and raising gasoline prices by nearly 250 percent. The government has doubled salaries for public sector employees and raised the minimum wage to help cushion the impact of rising prices. But the raise would only be enough to buy a third of the essential food that the World Food Program calculates a family of five requires each month. Critics of the Syrian president blame his measures for accelerating inflation and weakening the Syrian pound. The currency plunged to a record low of 15,500 pounds to the dollar last month. It had traded at 47 pounds against the dollar before the war. Joining us from Wellington in New Zealand is Karam Shah, an economist and a senior fellow at the New Lines Institute. Sir, protests have been mostly in Soweto. Why is that? Is that part of the country more impacted than other provinces? I think when it comes to living conditions, uh, the situation in Sueda is as bad as it is in other regime-held areas. I think what happened in Sueda um, continues to be contained there more for social and political reasons than for economic reasons. The price of oil, the price of fuel, has been multiplied by more than three recently. But here's a surprising thing about that, which is that Syria used to be an oil-producing country, and now it has to import its oil from mostly Iran. How did we get to that point? Well, due to a combination of reasons. So most of uh, oil fields are currently at the control, uh, under the control of the Syrian Democratic Forces in the, in the Northeast. Uh, and the fields that are under the control of the regime have been badly damaged throughout the conflict. Uh, primarily because of uh, bombing from the international coalition against ISIS. And um, basically, the Syrian regime is unable to uh, fix these oil fields and continue uh, the level of production. So most of these fields at, are operating at a production, like a production capacity level that's maybe 20% of its uh, pre-war level. Whose fault is all this? Because the protesters blame the Assad government for mismanaging the economy, and the Assad government says it's actually all to do with Western sanctions on the economy. Obviously, it's extremely complicated, and there are uh, a combination of factors. But I think if I had to rank them, 
uh, I would say the the number one reason why the country is struggling at the moment is the thuggery uh, of the Syrian regime. The reason the country reached to this stage uh, is above all because of the, the level of violence exercised by the Syrian regime. However, even as the conflict uh, and the level of violence waned, uh, what happened was uh, the opposite of what you would expect in, in other contexts. The economy deteriorated further still, and that is because of the economic mismanagement of the regime. The regime is not allowing even its own cronies to operate in the business sector. Uh, it's imposing uh, fines on them, trying to partner with any remaining business that's still generating profit. However, obviously, there are other factors that contribute to the current living conditions. Sanctions is one of them, but it's definitely not among the key contributors to what's happening. All right, Karam, uh, stand by, stay with us, because there's another interesting part of this puzzle that we want to mention, which is that China's President Xi Jinping has recently offered to help rebuild Syria. Uh, Xi met Bashar al-Assad in the southern Chinese city of Hangzhou, which is hosting the Asian Games at the moment. Assad's rare visit is in an attempt to end more than a decade of diplomatic isolation. Also noteworthy, the Syrian president has recently re-established ties with Arab nations that once backed his enemies, the Syrian rebels. Karim, we mention all this because it raises the question, could this be a lifeline? I mean, Chinese economic re-engagement, Arab economic re-engagement with Syria, could that be a lifeline for the Syrian economy? Well, first, regarding the recent rapprochement from regional countries, that seems to be all but dead because the Syrian regime failed to provide anything in exchange for that diplomatic recognition and the promise of uh, economic aid. Uh, for China, I think uh, all that China is doing at this stage is basically just waving the Syrian card in, in the face of the West and saying, hey, that's one of the cards that we can actually use. There's this regime that you despise that you're trying to isolate, we can rehabilitate it and work with it. I highly doubt China is genuinely interested in investing in Syria. Uh, China has a long history of giving promises and not following on them, uh, not just in Syria, in, in Iran, for example. You remember three years ago, there was the promise of investing over $40 billion in infrastructure projects, and virtually none of that actually happened. Um, if you look at China's investments in, in other sanctioned countries in, in Africa, say Sudan before the downfall of the Bashir uh, regime or in Zimbabwe, um, China does invest in countries heavily sanctioned by the West only when there is enough certainty about the political future of the regime. In Syria, that does not exist, and China realizes that. So I highly doubt they would be willing to take any risks by investing in infrastructure projects that tend to take uh, many, many years to come to fruition. Okay, so if there's economic mismanagement, there are sanctions, uh, the outside world right now is not going to help, or, as you've just explained. Are there any silver linings here? Is there any reason to hope for the majority of Sy Syrians who are living in poverty? I must admit I'm, I'm uh, not optimistic at all. The only way out for the country, uh, the way I see it, is through a political transition. And the, uh, the main obstacle to that political transition continues to be the Syrian regime, who Bashar al-Assad refuses to budge, refuses to give any meaningful political concessions from day one since March 2011 to date. And because of that, I think the living conditions, the economy will only continue to worsen. All right, Karam Shah, an economist and a senior fellow at the New Lines Institute. Thank you so much for joining us on the program. Thanks for having me. Demand for uranium fell drastically after the 2011 nuclear accident in Japan, and that's because dozens of reactors, which rely on uranium across the world, were forced to shut down after the meltdown. But the $10 billion market is now making a strong comeback. Prices soared to their highest level since the Fukushima disaster recently. Industry experts are warning of a supply crunch that could push costs even further up in the coming years. Let's have a look at the numbers that we're talking about. Prices for uranium jumped to nearly $66 per pound over the past month. Now compare that to the one-off peak of almost $140 a pound back in 2007. 
Uranium prices slumped down to the range of about $20 after the Fukushima disaster, for reasons that we've explained, and then they went up again following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Moscow is the world's largest enricher of uranium, and the war has also raised risks to energy supply chains. A rush to secure alternative supplies to Russia's oil and gas has pushed up demand for uranium again. So did the push by governments to go green. Countries around the world are ramping up nuclear power capacity to meet their zero carbon targets. The World Nuclear Association expects demand for uranium to nearly double by 2040. Alongside prices, the stocks of uranium miners are also rallying. Well, joining us from Paris to shed light on all of this is Paul Dorfman. You are the founder and chair of the Nuclear Consulting Group. You're also an associate fellow of Science Policy Research Unit at the University of Sussex. So we've outlined the reasons why demand is increasing while the supply is not quite matching demand. So it makes sense that the prices are going up. That is going to continue for the foreseeable future, correct? Not necessarily. Reuters say that a, a hyped uranium investors face potential fallout risk. And that's because all of this based on the idea that nuclear could quickly help with decarbonization. But according to the UK government department Bayes, which is a strongly pro-nuclear uh, paper to parliament, it takes up to 17 years to build just one nuclear power plant. So there are significant questions as to whether uh, this uh, boom will continue. Um, what does this mean for consumers? Because especially since the start of the war, uh, the Ukraine war, consumers will be keenly aware that when the price, uh, prices of, say, electricity goes up, well, then, you know, their, their cost of living becomes a much bigger problem. So if the price of uranium goes up and uranium ultimately is the source product for making electricity in a fair few countries, what will that mean for consumers? Well, it has to be understood that Kazakhstan, which provides 42% of all uranium worldwide to all reactors worldwide, all of their uranium goes via Russian ports. And uh, non embargo there's no question of embargoing any of that uh, currently at the moment. Mm. So there are some strategic, uh, political, uh, military uh, questions associated, as well as the one that you've alluded to, which is cost. Basically, in the short term, this won't change very much for, for consumers. The key to all of this is that nuclear needs vast subsidy to be built. The market has fled new nuclear. Mm. Large nuclear is only being built in command and control states rather like China. But what about, well, I was going to ask you about countries like Russia, China, India, which apparently are looking to nuclear as sources of energy in the medium term. That's absolutely right. Um, it's not really the medium term, given the fact. The fact is that uh, the, the, the numbers state quite clearly that it takes up to 17 years to build just one nuclear power plant, 17 years. So we must ask the question, do we have time and do we have the money for nuclear? But in terms of India, China, Russia, uh, India is depending on Russia. and We know what that involves in terms of the, the current climate. There's a few outliers. The UK, as usual, always an outlier. Uh, Poland is potentially thinking about it. There's a few sort of outliers in terms of nuclear. But actually, when one thinks about uh, net zero, the International Energy Agency states very clearly that renewables will do the heavy lifting for net zero, the energy transition. What's the single biggest thing, then, that you want our viewers to remember about this when they're thinking about uranium prices and what you said about, you know, where things are headed in the short to medium term? In the short term, uranium is probably a good bet. But then the market, you know, we know that the market is based on boom and bust. Uh, Reuters say, say that there are risks associated with this boom. But the market is the market. The reality is where we're going with net zero, the reality is, is that unfortunately, whether you like nuclear or you don't, it seems very likely that nuclear is just too late for the climate and the energy crisis. Meanwhile, renewables is forging ahead in a sort of uh, unparalleled kind of way. So what it looks like very clearly is that the renewable evolution is here and now. Okay, really interesting parting thought. Thank you for your insights. Paul Dorfman, founder and chair of the Nuclear Consulting Group. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.
And that is our show for this week. Get in touch with us on X, formerly known as Twitter, at Vanier Cyril. And do use the hashtag AJCTC when you do, or drop us an email, counting the cost at aljazeera.net. That's our address. But there's more for you online at aljazeera.com slash CTC. That'll take you straight to our page, which has individual reports, links, and entire episodes for you to catch up on. That is it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Cyril Vanier from the whole team here in Doha. Thank you for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next.